Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, March 6th, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, today so far, we are seeing, we saw gap ups early in the session. Market got off to a good start, but you can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average now down 103 points. We had moved up above that 20-day moving average, but we are struggling to stay above it. The S&P 500 only down one point, so on a relative basis, certainly performing much better than the Dow. The NASDAQ gapped up and remains higher. It's up 16 points right now. The Russell 2000, which has begun to show some life on a relative basis, up 1.6 points today. The 10-year Treasury yield, you can see, is down slightly today, 2.87%. But this sideways consolidation that we've been speaking of does continue. Volatility index back up over 19, but you can see much lower than we saw back on Friday when we were up over 26. So uh, some of that fear is starting to subside in the market. The uh, XLB is leading the action today. Materials up almost one half of 1%. Technology also having a pretty good day, uh, up uh, about 0.2%. And in that space, Check out these semiconductors trying to make a breakout here. And among that group, Intel leading, trying to break out. We saw Micron yesterday, actually the last couple of days, uh, with a huge move to the upside and getting that breakout. Looks like Intel trying to make the breakout today. To the downside, we have consumer staples and uh, utilities, both of which are defensive groups. And you can see they are having some uh, rough times after trending lower most of the past uh, five to six weeks as well. And with that, let me bring in my co-host, Aaron. How are you doing this morning, Aaron? I'm doing quite well. Got a big hockey game tonight. Yeah, we got a battle. We got a battle going on tonight, <laughs> you and me. It should be great. I mean, we're both uh, fairly evenly matched if you count points for the Anaheim Ducks, of course, my team and the Washington Capitals. Yeah, but you don't have the you don't have the season, the regular season background that we have. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm all set for a bet, you know, Oh, just, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, I'm still debating. We're on the road. I'm trying to cower out of it if it's, if at all possible. All right. I'll make you uh, draw, uh, make a go duck sign. And then you have to uh, go on, on the show and, and quickly show that on the screen. What do you think? Oh, now you're asking me to do something technologically driven. Which <laughs> all right. We'll figure something out, but, uh, I think you'll be more interested if uh, your capitals win tonight. <laughs> yeah, then I'll then I'll let you know what you owe me. In the meantime, we do have a guest on from uh, Canada. Of course, he's not in Canada today, but he is a Calgary Flames fan. Greg Schnell, it's good to have you, my friend. Welcome back to the show. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, my Flames are trying to cook it up, but right now we're uh, we're in a fight with Aaron's. Uh, good friends there so that's a bit yeah. of a problem for me you guys need to pick it up and get uh some some streaks going <laughs> True you, gotta, you, could, you just gotta hope you don't flame out <laughs> yeah. we've made lots of jokes between the two of us about <laughs> duck hunting season etc <laughs> yeah. going to a duck roast <laughs> the whole anaheim duck thing going i don't know about this anyway we got a lot going on uh, uh, it's awesome having you with us greg we're gonna have you come in maybe do a little Everything stock charts, a little PNF, uh, but you're going to do that for us in about 10, 15 minutes or so. In the meantime, Aaron, I'm going to let you go through our weekly schedule and the agenda. Absolutely. So tomorrow we have the illustrious Martin Pring. Very excited to talk to him. And then we did manage to get Tushar uh, Chande coming in on Thursday. So quite a big lineup here. And then, of course, Friday, Tom will be doing uh, his workshop uh, with the subject to be determined. So if you're interested in putting in some ideas for him, just take that survey that's below your viewer. But for today, we're going to start with everything stock charts. And uh, as we said, Greg's here for that. And we are going to do a new segment called Sound Off. And we'll explain that when we get there. But it's going to be a lot of fun. 10 and 10 to 1, our first symbol is going to be UPLD, Upland Software, if you want to go take a peek at that. And finally, we're going to end with our Agree or Disagree segment. And we've got a couple polls we're going to run today. So uh, if you're watching live, you can have a lot of fun with that. But I might pass it back to you, Tom, and let's get some technical news out there on the table. Sounds good. 10-year Treasury yield is on your charts here. You can see uh, it is sitting at 2.87%. We did get up almost touch 2.90, got to 2.897. 
uh, before turning back down. The sideways consolidation continues. Do you have a little bit of a trend line here? Maybe we got up against that, starting to roll back over again. I think we're going to probably continue between this 280, 295 range uh, for the foreseeable future. If we do move back below, below 280, there's a decent shot. We could hit this rising 50-day moving average because we do have a negative divergence here in on the 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, and that's what I generally look for is a 50-day test and or a trip back to the center line, which we are seem to be making our way back toward. Um, the only economic news out today, we had January factory orders came out at 10 a.m. Eastern, minus 1.4%. The market was looking for minus 1.3%. And so that was really not a big deal. That can be pretty volatile, um, but uh, it came in fairly close to expectations. And you can see that uh, the bond market really just kind of a big collective yawn at this point as we continue to consolidate there. I thought today what we would do um, for this segment is go back and let's pull up uh, the sector summary, which is where I like to start my day usually, is just as soon as the market opens, get a general sense for what's leading uh, and what's lagging. Uh, I mentioned in the open that the uh, materials group uh, performing very well so far today. Technology also doing well, actually consumer discretionary now, uh, just barely passing technology. And then of course at the bottom, you can see the defensive groups, healthcare, consumer staples, and utilities. So even though we did come off the highs on the Dow and we're off the highs on the other major indices, um, the defensive groups are lagging. We continue to see most of the aggressive groups, consumer discretionary, technology, industrials, and financials in the upper half of the sector leaderboard. And I continue to find that to be very bullish. Uh, I don't see the appetite for risk uh, waning at all. I think the market continues to have that appetite for risk. And I think that's going to be important going forward in uh, trying to resume this bull market. Um, one thing you can do when you're at this page, you can you see this uh, period intraday. So this is just telling us what's going on in these sectors for today. But we've really struggled over the last several weeks. If we go back and just pull up a month, one month chart, you can see that technology is actually the best performing group. Through all this volatility, technology has been the leader. And when you look down toward what's lagging, and uh, I was talking to Greg and Aaron before the show, really surprised that energy has kind of fallen apart the way it has on a relative basis. But we've got energy and consumer staples down at the bottom. So we've got an aggressive group leading uh, energy, which I kind of just look at as neutral. I think it could go either way, whether we're bullish or bearish. It could be a leader or a lagger, just depending on a lot of different things, geopolitical concerns, the dollar, a lot of other outside influences. Um, but consumer staples is a defensive group. And I always like to see consumer staples underperforming the consumer discretionary group. And we have been seeing that over the past month continue. So overall, I mean, I really think that this setup over the last month, given all the weakness and the, the gyrations, the volatility back and forth, I think this continues to hold up pretty well. And if you go into the complete industry summary, of course, you're going to get the intraday as the uh, default. But I can, again, pull up the one month. And all of a sudden, you can take a quick look at what's working and what's not working over the last month. You see that the specialty retailers remain up near the top. Here's apparel retailers, broadline retailers. So retailers continuing to do well. And that's important because if we pull up the seasonality and just pull up uh, the XRT, which is the retail ETF, um, and drag it back over the last 13 years, we're kind of in this sweet spot on a seasonal basis. February, March, and April tends to be strong, uh, stronger than any other period throughout the year for retail. So again, if we go back in here and look at the, whoops, I may have gone too far there, uh, but let's pull up the um, industry groups. And once again, for the last month, now you see these retailers up here, kind of makes sense from a, not only a, a technical perspective, because we've talked a lot about the retailers, but also from a seasonal perspective, this is a, a, a group, uh, this is a part of the market that tends to do really well February through April. So I'm not surprised that they are holding up as well as they are. If you move down toward the bottom, I mean, you're going to see home construction, you're going to see furnishings, you're going to see home improvement retailers, kind of a common theme there that has not been performing well. Uh, we warned at the beginning of the year about home construction. It was the second best industry group in 2017. And a lot of times money will chase after performance in the past, and it usually doesn't do well. Uh, that usually doesn't work out well going forward because the market rotates. 
we see leadership from a lot of different areas. And right now, with interest rates on the rise, home construction certainly underperforming. So that's noteworthy. But literally, you can go through and look at all of these different areas to see what's leading, what's lagging. Computer hardware, you might be surprised that computer hardware uh, featuring Apple and uh, some of the stocks in that area, network appliance, uh, those stocks are doing pretty well. And over the last month, they've held up very well in this uh, pullback. Semiconductors, which are very aggressive, uh, I find it uh, you know, pretty bullish that this group throughout the, all the volatility is up almost 8% over the last month. So you can make some generalizations and get a, a certainly a feel for the market, I think, by taking a look at this every once in a while and just pulling up a little bit more of the I'm not I don't want to call it big picture because one month certainly is not a big picture. But uh, we do get you know caught up in what's going on today and yesterday sometimes. So it's not a bad idea to pull back. Steel has had a huge move up. You can see up almost nine percent over the last month, continuing to perform well, although I think it was the uh, laggard in that space uh, so far today. Renewable energy is starting to pick back up again after having a very solid 2017 and then a pullback. But over the last month, we are seeing some strength there. You can see tires have been down 15%. Uh, apparently, they need some new tread. And uh, you can just go down the list. Um, but let's go in. I want to talk a little bit about a few individual stocks here before we get into, uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Schnell. Uh, so first, let's take a look at Target. Target came out with their earnings this morning. Top line was fine, $22.77 billion. Uh, the market was only expecting $22.46 billion. So top line was no problem. But they did increase wages as a result of the new tax law that was passed. Uh, so they were talking a little bit about that. Uh, anyhow, the earnings did come up a little bit short. So while revenue was strong and above expectations, earnings came in $1.37 the market was expecting a dollar 39 and you can see right now target down 5.02%. Still we do have equal highs right here and so far we have higher lows and off of an uptrend this could turn out at some point to be a an ascending triangle. So I would be watching for a reversing candle on these earnings either today or maybe over the next couple of days. If it's not an ascending trial maybe maybe it comes back down and test and we have the sideways rectangular consolidation after an uptrend. Either way, I find it to be pretty bullish. And one thing to keep in mind is that Target is a part of the broadline retailers. And when you look at the broadline retailers, you see a lot of strength there. Target relative to the group is obviously dropping, especially today with earnings. But Target up until today was actually a very good performer relative to the S&P 500 and broadline retailers have been one of the strongest areas of the market relative to the S&P 500. So Target is not in a bad space. Yes, they came up a little bit short on their bottom line, but they did beat on revenues. And I could see this one getting to a point where we get a reversing candle and maybe make another push back to the upside. So this is one worth watching. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, upgrades and downgrades. Very interesting charts on some of these. Mylan, M-Y-L. Got an upgrade. Look at it making a breakout above this prior top. I think this is bullish, and I think eventually we might see a little bit of a cup here forming. So I think this is a big technical development on Mylan. ALB, Albemarle, can see a big breakdown. Now here we're getting an upgrade, but I don't like this upgrade. This is a lot of selling, a breakdown. Uh, the move up, in my opinion, is probably getting close to a key resistance level where if I was interested in shorting, I might be more interested on the short side, despite this upgrade. UPS, of course, UPS took a big hit when Amazon came out and said they were getting into UPS and FedEx space. Uh, but we are consolidating here. It got an upgrade. I would watch this 20-day moving average and price resistance just above 108. I think if we can get through about 109 and get a little volume coming in, we could put these lows behind us on UPS. I think this is an interesting chart. BG Bunge. Uh, let's take a look here. Here we got a gap up. We do have a prior gap resistance just above 79. That's where we opened today. We failed. We need to get back up above today's open. Very quickly, a couple downgrades. GRUB, Grub, uh, Grub Hub. Huge move up. This was earnings related. It's had a huge uh, advance since then. Uh, we do see that the PPO is rolling over, and we've been going through some sideways consolidation still with a downgrade. The buyers have come right back in. The stock is down 2.6%, but it is well off the lows. Uh, and then finally, the last one, this is a downgrade on Sempra, or excuse me, Spectra. 
Energy Partners, SEP. Stock has been going down for quite some time, challenging a very key support level. Uh, this needs to hold uh, or we could see some lower prices here. I don't like the action here on uh, Spectra and don't like that downgrade. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Schnell. He's got some interesting stuff. It's great to have him back. You ready to go, Greg? I am. We're uh, just pumping up my screen here. Let me uh, get this engaged and we'll start working here. Okay, so what I wanted to do today um, as part of the Everything Stock Charts was talk specifically to um, some point and figure charts. But uh, my Twitter feed had some interesting comments this weekend. And one of the comments was, Greg, how could you be bearish on oil and gas? The 50s above the 200 on oil. So you're just way out to lunch. And um, and somebody else had said, you know, it, Greg, how could you be so optimistic on oil and gas? Uh, so it, it's, I think the problem is, is if you don't follow regularly, uh, you might be using old charts or whatever. So one of the things I wanted to talk specifically about today was uh, some of the discrepancies we're seeing in a point and figure chart. And just uh, let me spend one minute and go through a point and figure chart. Um, I've tried to expand these quite a bit so that you can see the the price action more closely rather than the date. So anyway, this is a two year chart. We're looking at West Texas crude and you can see West Texas has come up and made this flag pattern. And uh, specifically when when we had, uh, or pennant pattern, specifically when we had uh, charting historically, they used point and figure charts. So I'm gonna do a brief review on what these are. So A, B, and C in here are October, November, December. This is January, February, March. And, and what happened is the first time it makes a price movement um, far enough to actually set off a change in the chart it will put the month there. So this doesn't mean it happened February 1st, it means it happened sometime in February. And, and if there's no letter or number there, uh, that month there was not enough movement in the price to actually change the chart. So anyway, August we had a low and then we came back, we were on a downtrend, then we pushed off and September, October, November and December were all up. January continued to be up and now we've rolled over. But let me compare that with the chart for the exploration and production. And the reason I want to do that is you can see that this chart isn't anywhere near as bullish as the oil chart. And the problem we've got is that these stocks have been, the red lines are automatic, they get put in by the uh, software. And so there was an uptrend and then when right in here, when this uptrend was broken, this red line was drawn. So you're in a downtrend until the red line is broken. So in January, the price of the exploration and production stocks broke above. So this is an ETF that tracks the people looking for the oil, not, not refining the oil. Um, broke above this red downtrend. And that would automatically add this uh, blue line at the most recent low. So we're, we're climbing up on here, but the real problem we've got is that uh, recently we've sold off quite hard and we're trying to hold in this area. Now, if we look back through the chart, you can see for the last three years, this $32 level has been pretty important. We continued to make a low there, a low here, a low here, a low there, a low here, and working our way across the chart, this 32 level is pretty important. So what we want to take into account on all of this is that the um, as the chart uh, forms, you're trying to look at the big picture. And the big picture is there is a bucket load of resistance here at, uh, you know, call it 32 to $37. And basically the price has swung in here for a couple of years, making no real progress. And when we compare that to the broader market, which have obviously been on fire or at least doing much better than this chart, um, we're at the low end of the range here. So um, to be bullish on oil is one thing. To be bullish on oil stocks is a whole different service or a whole different look at it. And one of the things that we like to look at as technicians is how things are working in what we call intermarket analysis. So oil's doing one thing. What are the oil stocks doing? And it's quite clear that they're not anywhere near as bullish as West Texas crude. So let's just go back and look at that crude chart again. You can see it's up, up, and away. And the oil chart is almost the opposite. Uh, so really not that bullish for um, buying exploration and production stocks. Okay, here's the oil services. And a lot of times these companies 
are um, uh, they will help show the activity starting to pick up a little bit more. So they're starting to get purchase orders for activity. That's not what we like to see. You know, we're down here testing some of these major lows that go all the way into 2017. Now, the fact that price hasn't dropped all the way to new 52-week lows doesn't make this very bullish. Uh, this green box is saying this is how far the price would have to get to before you'd actually get a reversal signal. And so uh, currently at 1524, we're well above. And we really want 1450 to hold here because if we start to get down under $14, all of this support in here will be broken again. And so it looks more like a continuing downtrend. And you can see we're we've put the red line up here because we've now broken this blue line to the downside. So oil and oil <laughs> services really are not in the bull trend that we would like to see comparing that with with oil itself now here's natural gas this charts just you know this is going back 10 years not a whole bunch of profit here and so this is based on price now we can change this to percentage over here and the reason i want to do that is it changes the chart quite a bit but recently it sold off in this is february came back down and we've had not enough price movement uh to generate uh, since march started we haven't had enough price movement to generate the the number three here so uh, these commodities are pretty weak and you can see testing the previous low so that makes it very uh very very low now i just want to show uh work through about five more of these and just give you an idea of how the pnf chart works so this is coal the coal etf and you can see that we've been down trending for a couple of years here this is 2011 to 2018 um, just recently broke out in January, February pulled back, and in March we haven't moved enough either way, but we're near this low end of the range. Um, it's given us a buy signal because of this big push up here, and so that's what this price objective is showing us. But in general, you see the chart really downtrending, and so coal is used to uh, generate power or to melt steel for the most part, or uh, industrial metals. So seeing a big downtrend in coal um, not really match the price movement we've seen in steel is quite interesting. This is copper and uh, again this is price uh, sitting here and if I used an actual price scale the chart is so flat so I've switched this one to percentage like I did for natural gas and so the box sizes are one percent but you can see in general we've made no progress since um, you know this was September here was August uh, in general we're going sideways with copper and uh, there was an old expression called Do Dr. Copper but the problem we've got <laughs> uh, with Dr. Copper is it hasn't reflected the stock market at all um, Dr. Copper has been trending up for the last two years, but it's really spent uh, almost 10 years kind of trading in a pretty tight range. Uh, so this this uh, sideways activity here is really not that bullish considering we were expecting the global economy to start turning up again for, for this to be static around where it was in September isn't kind of the price action we were hoping for. This is the copper miners. So remember where the last chart was copper up in, in the top right hand corner. We have exactly the opposite problem down here. And this goes back to 2012 and these copper miners are kind of sitting where they were back in 2011, 2012 um, in terms of a bounce back up. But still on the chart of life, they're, they're in pretty rough shape. So uh, we had a recent breakout to the upside up here. We've had a pullback. Now, as long as we're making higher lows and higher highs, it's a bullish chart. Um, that I would agree. Now, the only problem is here we are um, October, November, and then December of 2017. Here's January, February, March, April, May, June, July. And you can see that. Anyway, here we are with 2018. And since the beginning of the year, we haven't done anything. Um, even though we had a recent breakout, uh, we've kind of rolled over and just traded sideways. So the chart isn't bearish, but it's hardly as bullish as that copper chart has pointed to. Gold, big sideways trading range. I think we're all pretty much aware of that. Hasn't really had any upside momentum, and we're currently trading right near the previous low. So we've had trouble breaking out of this triple top, and right now we're looking, if, if it breaks any lower, like below 1300 so it would actually have to register 1299.99 to get down here um, 
if it starts to break to lower lows, obviously that's pretty bearish after this triple top resistance. Now let's lo go look at the gold miners. And what we see on this particular chart is they're trying to uptrend, but I mean, this is a, you know, sideways consolidation for the last two years. And, you know, if you'd have been in the S&P, you're up 20 or 30%. If you've been in gold stocks, you're not up. So uh, really kind of a tough uh, market to be in. We've recently tested this triple bottom for all, almost all of 2017. And if this doesn't hold here, obviously we'd make a new red downtrend line uh, by falling below this blue line. So it's We've had a two-year uptrend in a lot of the commodities. Um, the problem is we're not really seeing it in the commodity-related stocks. Hey, Greg, quick yes. question for you. Uh, we have two. One is uh, how do you get that red or green square on the right side of your charts? Okay. And the other one was is it uh, looking at a P&F, is, is that similar to just looking at a monthly chart? It's not so much monthly. What PNF does is it takes out all the minimal movements, and unless the price moves at least three boxes, so in this case it has to move a buck fifty to to roll over. Um, so it, in this case, it's on a column of X is higher, and the price actually has to break down to this sixteen fifty level and touch it in order. It'll put these three boxes in at the same time. So then it came down to. Um, this level here in December, and you can see in January it turned up and gave us this column of X's, but we haven't been able to break out to a higher high, and now we're rolling over. So this box um, is put on here automatically by the stock chart software, and it basically shows it, uh, what it would take for this chart to roll over and change trend. So in this particular case, we're trading at 1641, it, it would have to make a box down here at $16, which you can see from the scale, 1550, 1650. If it got to 16.00 or 15.99, um, that would be enough to put a column of O's and come down and test the previous low. So the, the big issue with point and figure charting is it takes away a lot of the, I'll call it back and forth movement, and when price really starts to move one direction, that's when the chart really starts to show up. So typically you want to buy breakouts to the upside or sell breakdowns to the downside. All of these commodity related charts are really, really low. And my big consternation as doing the commodity countdown for the last couple of years is that we're just not getting the breakout in these stocks um, that we would have expected if we're in a big new bull market for commodities. And so here we are with the silver miners and you can see we've broken the the uptrend from 2016 and now we're rolling over and we just recently made a lower low the price objective is only 27 dollars and that's based on the size of the the uh, breakout range but the the problem we've got in general in commodities is if we were going to be hitting this new big bull market all of the commodity stocks should also start to really perform and i think so, so here's silver, and that's breaking out to new lows. If we just go refresh, here's gold miners. And, you know, the chart's in an uptrend, but again, we're testing the lows from 2017. So we're in the bottom right-hand corner of the chart. If we test copper miners, you know, we're, we're not quite in the bottom, at least we're halfway up. But this is almost a 10-year chart, and they've really done nothing. And when you consider the S&P 500 going back to, whatever, 2011, it's a lot higher than, than this chart. So trading off the 2016 low was obviously very bullish. But the fact that we've done nothing for almost, you know, a year, this was January 2000 or February 2017, um, and and we're sitting just barely above that level. It's hardly been bullish. And then let's just go look at the exploration and production stocks. Um, so, the, so the point I want to make is, yes, some of the commodities are bullish, but when we do technical analysis, one of the things we're looking for is a confluence of events or a confirmation by the actual stocks related to that. And we're just not seeing the breakouts in those stocks. And here we have, you know, th this is at the risk of breaking through to a new, um, you know, downtrend again. And you know, in on the big picture, we're getting lower highs and lower lows. Um, so far, this low has been holding, but, you know, it, it broke to new 52-week uh, lows in here. 
Now we've broken out. We didn't make it to new 52-week highs. And again, we're, I'll call it closer to the lows than the highs. So I'm a little more concerned that, that the oil stocks are going to break down again. Um, I did want to show one stock uh, just individually, and then we're going to wrap this up. And the reason I want to show it is Apache. And Apache is a very interesting stock for one major reason. They made the largest onshore oil find in the Permian Basin in the last 20 years. It is a huge find. And they locked up all of the land for two years without somebody else figuring out what they were doing. They went in when when uh, commodities were out of favor all through 2015, 2016, and bought the land. So remember how all of the commodities bounced in 2016 and started to take off. Look what Apache stock has been doing. And so the fundamentals couldn't be more bullish for this stock, but the technicals are clearly saying, you know, don't buy this stock yet. And even here in January, we had a breakout above uh, the previous highs, either this one or this one, things started to look rosy. What does it do? It gets right to our downtrend line, rolls back over, and makes new lower lows. So a value investor could say, gee, there's a lot of opportunity here if it ever starts to kick in. But in the meantime, you know, you could have bought and held for a year while, while the S&P was soaring higher and owned what should have been a fundamentally strong stock, and you know the investor should be in love with it, and yet they're not. So we sit right down here in March, we've made a new lower low. And at this point, uh, you know, clearly these stocks are out of favor. Now, again, they will bottom and someday they'll, they'll bounce. But the, the whole point of technical analysis is to try and take the fundamental picture. Um, you could use it as a backdrop, but you still want to know what the other investors are thinking of that stock because that's the person who's got to buy the stock from you in the end. And the bottom line here is, you know, We've been in a downtrend for six weeks. If you wanted to see this chart just on a regular uh, sharp chart, uh, just go down here. You know, this is a, pretty much a, a downtrend. And here it is on a weekly chart, and we're testing the 2016 low. You're trying to figure out, will this stock ever bounce? And maybe if the full stochastic starts to turn up and you could get a, a breakout. But my point would be this. If there was a bright spot in the oil industry in the U.S. for new reserves and huge upside with close proximity to shipping and pipelines and everything else, it should have been Apache. And yet here we are with a stock not moving. So with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, pass it back to my co-hosts and uh, hopefully that explains a little bit about why commodities might be bullish but why i'm negative on commodities because the inner market isn't matching hey greg yes first of all great presentation i i want to ask you a question here i'm going to pull up a chart real quick um, because you are kind of the energy commodity guru uh, at least that's uh, what i'm calling you <laughs> and uh you know, when I look at, um, this is a chart of the XLE. And so the top part is the XLE. This goes back 10 years. And then just below that, this is the price of crude oil. And then down here is the correlation between the two over the last 10 years. And you can see that the correlation tends to be very strong, which it should be. I mean, the price of crude oil and the way the XLE performs, you would think that there'd be a positive correlation. And the correlation indicator here confirms that. Uh, we spend a lot of time between, say, 0 .0 or 0 0.75 and 1, uh, meaning that there's a very, very tight positive correlation between the two. Now, when I look at this, and, and you know, energy is really kind of, uh, I've, I've been very perplexed over the whole energy thing because I thought when we started getting some of the earnings reports and we saw that XLE make a move up toward 80, taking out the October, or not October, uh, December 2016 high, I really thought that energy was going to outperform or at least perform among some of the best sectors. And quickly we, we retreated back. But I will say this. I mean, we do still have crude oil, which to me looks like it is coming off the bottom and continuing to move higher. We haven't really seen, in my opinion, we haven't seen crude oil break down the way that the price uh, or, you know, the way that the XLE has. And of course, the XLE, half of that's made up of ExxonMobil, Chevron and Schlumberger. But, I, you know, I do fa find some um you know maybe a little bit of bullishness in the fact that this trend line is holding similar to the one that we had from 2009 all the way through 2014 so i guess looking at this chart does this give you more hope for the xle to turn back up 
or would you maybe be waiting to see if the, if uh, crude oil turned back down? And if so, that might be an indication that the XLE isn't going to hold. I mean, does this help or hurt anything that you're you know you've spoken about in terms of energy? Yeah, let me. I'm going to steal the screen back here. Um, the the point that I would make is if we go look at the bullish percent index for energy. Um, I don't know if I did that right. Um, if we go look at the bullish percent index for energy, what you see here is we are down at 30%. Um, can, if we were going to be in a new bull market for energy, um, you know, oil, everything was up here together with oil, but now the energy stocks have started to lead to the downside there. You know, even the bullish percent index, and so just to refresh what that is, when a chart like Apache is on a buy signal, that would be one chart. So you take a group of stocks, so in this case they take the stocks in the energy group, and check how many of them as a percentage are on a buy signal, and at this point only 30% are on a buy signal. Now, you can see that when they get oversold and they start to take off to the upside, this is a pretty attractive place to be a part of the party. Um, let me just change the chart up here at the top. Um, I just grabbed another chart that I was uh, that I had with the bullish percent in it. So let me just put in here um, XLE. And and the point XLE also has uh, solar, nuclear. Um, so it's not just that great, but what you are not just related to oil. But what you see here is. While oil is still a big part of XLE, it's not the only part. And these stocks have rolled over, and XLE is kind of the easiest way to see that. But, you know, without question, there's an uptrend here, and maybe you want to try and, and play the bounce off this uptrend to a higher high. But it is shocking that, that the energy stocks got this week, um, so week as in W-E-A-K, um, through this recent pullback and they actually led the whole thing down. They were one of the first groups to be breaking down as the market started to crack. So I would be more inclined to be careful with energy because for some reason, all of the commodity stocks in general are not participating in the upside move. And if I had to pick um, something that I really liked, um, you know, or, that I'm really watching, and you guys are all watching it too, but it's the US dollar. We have spent seven weeks consolidating here. So after a major breakdown, we were unable to make any downside pressure. And what I think the commodity stocks are trying to tell us is until this is resolved one way or the other, um, you know, it's, it's tough work. So as the US dollar failed last week to break out, just trying to zoom in here as it failed to break out i think that's one of the more critical areas on the chart and if this was to start to continue leaking then you'll probably see the commodity stocks start to run but this failed breakout so far was about the only bullish thing we've seen in the last six weeks for commodities so okay well i appreciate that um yeah i will say this though your uh, the, the bullish percent chart that you brought up um, back in 2011 and 2012, when we did pull back in the XLE and hit that trend line, the uh, bullish percent did not look very bullish back then either. So, uh, you know, we can make arguments either way. Um, and, and I'm not trying really to make an argument, yeah. just that I do think that the energy space does still have the possibility of a move to the upside. But let's go ahead and move on because we got an exciting segment that I want to get into. Uh, this is called Sound Off. This is going to be the first time that we've done this. Uh, Aaron and Greg are going to participate. I'm going to be the moderator. Uh, basically, what this segment is going to do is it's going to allow both of our uh, panelists, Aaron and Greg, 30 seconds ah. to sound off on a variety of stocks and ETFs. But if they go over their 30-second allotment, they're going to find out that their sound gets turned off. So literally, this is going to be a sound off if you take too long. <laughs> Um, so, and we're going to ask all of our audience to follow along with their arguments and develop your own opinions as you look at their charts and you look at your own charts. And at the end of the segment, we're going to take a poll as to which of the stocks and ETFs presented is, in your opinion, the strongest buy. So with that, I am first going to turn, I'm going to get my chart set up here uh, because I actually even set up a separate uh, style button, co combining a little bit of Aaron's charts and a little bit of Greg's charts, and they're going to feed off of this on my chart. 
So let me pull it up. And I can't believe somebody talked you into changing your chart style. Right? That was That's just impressive. unbelievable. All right. Do we have to go there? I mean, I'm already like seeing a therapist <laughs> twice a week. Uh, please. Uh, but let's let me get this thing up here. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. And by the way, when we go when you go through the survey at the end of the show, we'd like to know what you think. Not only the whole show, but uh, what you think of the sound off segment. I think it's gonna be fun. Uh, here's just a picture of the Dow, and uh, I thought I had set this up. Maybe I didn't. Let me set this up in the sound off chart style. Here we go. So we got PMO on the top. So this is what Erin likes. And we've got her uh, moving averages. And, of course, down below, we're going to have the scooter. And uh, we've got the uh, relative to the S&P 500 set up kind of in Greg style with the area showing underneath and so forth. But uh, so I'm going to give you one stock and you're each going to have 30 seconds and just say whatever you see on the chart. I mean, it could be bullish. It could be bearish. You could be a buyer. You could be a seller. You could just say avoid it, whatever. Um, but tell me what you see on these charts. I'm going to start off with a stock that I think everybody's probably interested in, and that is Apple. And first up is Aaron. What do you see on the chart, Aaron? All right. Well, momentum looks pretty good. We've still seeing that PMO rising, a little deceleration there, but I wouldn't be too worried about that. Uh, you know, the scooter and uh, relative strength are still looking strong, so I would I would be okay with that. Um, I'd like to have seen higher volume going on with this, the last two uh, up moves. We didn't, it kind of has been moving lower. Uh, but overall, the 20 is above the 50 day EMA and it bounced off that 20. I would be looking for a. Oh, that was 30 seconds, I guess. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Greg, you're up. I like Apple as a sell. And the reason is uh, this breakdown here where it's struggling to get through price, I'm seeing the scooter ranking is is very low here. Once the stock starts to break uh, you know, down into this bottom 10%, I'm not very bullish on it. And I think what you'll find in general is Apple at best is performing with the S&P 500 and not really outperforming it. So for me, the biggest thing that I would say on the stock is I don't want to own it. And this big move down on the PMO. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to know about that big move on the PMO, but too bad. Yeah. Uh, okay, so rising, so I'm I'm still okay with it. All right, but but Greg, we're going to turn your sound back on because we're going to give you the next one, and this is just the basic spider. The S and P 500 ETF tracks the overall benchmark uh, S and P. What do you think of this? Uh, I expect the S&P to move back to new highs. And and part of the reason for that is that the, uh, the, the group of large cap stocks has been outperforming the Russell for a while. I see the Russell is behaving more like the emerging markets and it doesn't seem to be working. So I think there's a rotation inside to the large cap stocks. And with the techs leading, it's it's crazy big. So I would expect that to continue to hold and the PMO looks like it wants to turn higher here. All right, there you go. Aaron, what do you think? Wow, you got it all in. Uh, yeah, I'm liking the PMO. It is starting to turn up, but the, all of that indecision, that flatness that we've seen has been of issue to me. I That's why I haven't been a full on bull at this point. I, I think it's positive. We got back over that 20 day EMA and I think the 20 needs to hold above that 50. So at this point, you know, I see that declining tops trend line. I would be looking for a breakout from there. Uh, but if we turn back down, uh, watch that PMO, it's, it's going to. All right. I think that's it. 30 seconds is up. Next up, uh, Aaron, we're going to give you the first shot. Uh, that was the spider. How about the Russell 2000 IWM? Ah, Russell. Screen. Hold on. Sound off. There we go. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, PMO buy signal. We're starting to see some um, positive momentum. I like those rising bottoms on the PMO. Uh, we have, let's see, the 20 is just below the 50. So that's bad, but I'd like to see it pop up above there. Probably will uh, if we get a break out there above 156. I, you know, I'm looking at a possible ascending triangle, maybe getting ready to form. Uh, I'd be looking for a breakout at 156. I'm assuming 156, uh, but let's go, Greg. What do you see? Uh, you know, the PMO starting to turn up, but again, from negative, um, it had a lower high on the last high. It's made a lower low recently. Uh, I would expect it might be able to taste tech 
test the previous high around 160, but I'm not expecting much of a breakout. I think it'll roll back over by then. And the uh, the scooter looks more bullish than everything else, but the um, relative strength says no. Okay. Uh, that's the third one. You got two more to go here. This is one that uh, was a recent public offering, captured a lot of attention. Uh, they recently came out and beat revenue and EPS estimates. Uh, the stock certainly, you know, got a pop. What do you think of it now? Snap. And the first one up is going to be Greg. I would be a seller of this stock. And the big reason is this base. And then all of the movement was in one day. Um, it's pulled back to support. I know Tom would probably like to trade it off support here. But I think the relative strength on this is too uh, weak for it to really start to outperform. So I'm not expecting much from the stock. All right, I do own it actually, so you, you got that one right. Erin, uh, what do you think? All right, well, I see that 50 is below the 200, but we are seeing that margin thinning, which is positive. Uh, but I don't like the fact that we could be looking at a, a descending triangle here, and that would assume a breakdown below that 200 day EMA. Uh, the PMO doesn't look that healthy, it's gone a sell signal and moving lower. Uh, I'm not a fan. Maybe if you got a breakout, uh, gosh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just not a fan. I, I agree with you two on that relative strength. Uh, nope, that's it. And that wasn't me cutting them off either. That was uh, our producer. <laughs> just because I owned it, they, they won't give me the opportunity. I would have cut them both off pretty early. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got one more. This is the stock with the highest scooter score among large caps right now at 99.9. .9. Can its relative strength continue? And by the way, before I even pull it up, do either of you know which one it is? Twitter. There you go, hey, Mr. Scooter. All right, Twitter. First up is Aaron. Go ahead. Oh, wow. Yeah, that scooter is pretty happy. Uh, the relative strength's going pretty well. I, I'm not happy about the fact it's getting hung up there, though, at override resistance. But the PMO is turning up. Looks like it might have had a, a bull kiss and is heading higher, like the bounce off the 20. I would just... Uh, I, I really am nervous about that, that not having that breakout just yet. Everything else looks so positive. And uh, so basically, I think this one looks pretty strong. I, I would really want to see that breakout, though, before I, I got in. Or I'd set a tight stop, you know, maybe. Around maybe around somewhere. All right, Greg, you're up. What do you think of Twitter? Okay, well, I think that the price action on Twitter has been phenomenal when you look at the price action on the overall market. I mean, somewhere in the overall market, there was a downtrend of 12%. Twitter's just blowing it out the top. Um, it broke out of a huge two-year base. I love that. Uh, the relative strength is at the highest point on the chart. The scooter's at 99.9. .9. You just want to try and buy and hold this thing. I think it'll be a wild ride, but you want to stay in it. All right, sounds good. Well, I tell you what, that was fun. Uh, for the most part, you got all your comments in. We actually were trying this earlier before the show started, and it was kind of funny because uh, the first one that we tried, I think uh, Aaron and Greg both went in about 10 seconds. I think they were afraid they are going to get zapped. Uh, but th that was good analysis by both of you. I think that was a, a lot of fun. And now we're going to put up the, uh, uh, the poll for everyone to take a look at these five that we talked about, Apple, and, of course, we had two ETFs, the Spider, the S&P 500. Uh, the IWM attracts the Russell 2000, Snap, and Twitter. I mean, five pretty good choices. And the winner so far, I mean, you can keep going, but the winner so far at this point is overwhelmingly Twitter, 56%. Who would have thought this about four or five months ago? Anybody? Well, I would have been a buyer of Twitter the moment it broke out from its uh, big base. I think uh, we might have even had a don't ignore this chart saying don't ignore that chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think their earnings, they've had a couple of good earnings reports. I think that's what happened here in early February, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was on an earnings report. And even though we did finish well off the highs, uh, we made a move back up. As I think it was Aaron that met, mentioned that we're holding on to that rising 20-day moving average and moving up, testing the highs. And I, I really find it difficult, as you said, Greg, to ignore that the stock is outperforming the S&P 500 during a period where there's a lot of volatility. Twitter making, you know, trying to make new highs and break above thirty five dollars. So, so what do you think of Snap being in the bottom right now, <laughs> considering you own it? <laughs> well, why do we have to go there? <laughs> well, that was a bear shot across the bow. Yeah. Oh, so. of course. Well, All right. I mean, seriously, right? Isn't that interesting, though? I, I think. Uh, my, I, I think it's interesting people are into the spy right now, too, a little bit. Well, I will say this about Snap. 
I pulled the chart up and I think this is what happens psychologically in the market. I think you get a big move up. A lot of people get excited. And when a stock goes through a period of pulling back to a support level or even into gap support, I didn't think it would go below 17, to be honest. But I think on one of the shows, I said I wouldn't be surprised to see a 1650 move. And some of that was based on uh, having uh, Bruce Fraser in and talking about Wyckoff in the spring and having that false breakdown before a big move to the upside. I think that's what's happened. And I think the move up is going to go back up and test that 2021 level. That just my opinion. And maybe the, the uh, f- uh, 4% that are in favor of Snap, <laughs> maybe the rest of you will be right. And Snap doesn't perform well, but uh, the 4% of uh, uh, we need to talk. Cause I, I, I agree with you. All right. Excellent. <laughs> So with that, that was a fun segment, though. And definitely when we get to the um, when you get to the survey at the end of the show, I'd like to get everybody's feedback, because I think when we have guests on the show, I think this would be a fun segment, Uh, you know, having Greg participate. Maybe, you know, I'll go up the head to head sometime. Yes. And you can moderate. But it would uh, it's definitely fun. Uh, You got to give your your thoughts in there quick. And I think the one thing it really says is think about how long it takes to analyze a stock fundamentally. And what you all just did looking at these charts in 30 seconds and tell me that there isn't some merit to technical analysis and being able to look at relative strength in the scooter, which is exclusive to stock charts folks right here. And uh, being able to look at the moving averages and a PMO or whatever other momentum indicator you want to use. I think it's awesome. So I thought it was a fun segment. Yes, I love when we can do polls as well. So and I I know we're going to do one more poll before the end of the show as well. Yep, we got one coming up. But first, we're going to move into the 10 and 10. So if you'd like to show the uh, 10 and 10 stocks on an RRG, are you ready for that? I am pretty much ready for that. Let's go over here. I'm going to share my desktop. This is the first time I've had to share my screen today. It's pretty pretty crazy, actually. So before that segment, I, I put in all of the requests uh, that you had, and they're all listed right here. Let's go ahead and we'll look quickly at that RRG. I think that's always interesting. All right. So I, I would definitely want to know what's going on with uh, uh, Nectar. So that'll be interesting to look at. Uh, look at very nice Netflix, Amazon, all moving in that uh, northeast direction. Actually, a lot of these are moving in a northeast direction. So I think that's pretty interesting in and of itself. But let's look at the table. Here are the ones that are leading. And these are improving, I believe, is what we call that, right? Improving, yes. So these are the ones that I usually am pretty interested in looking at, but I, I'm going to mix it up. Don't, don't worry. Just hey, Tom, look, up. GDXJ is on there. Uh-oh. Yeah. You know I was going to pick something like that with you here, Greg. So, <laughs> so with that, let's go ahead and start with our first one, uh, Upland Software, UPLD. All right, let's pull it up. I already annotated it, so we'll get through this one very quickly. Um, I love the, the heavy volume move right here big volume bar and look at that beautiful candle Uh, that to me reeks of accumulation doesn't mean that we won't pull back temporarily and in fact i would actually use any kind of pullback to uh uh as an opportunity to get in software is one of the strongest areas of the market as well i talked about broadline retailers earlier but uh, clearly software has been uh, a great area of the market outperforming the s p 500 as well you got a stock that's got the ppo pointing straight up so we've got price uh, momentum accelerating any kind of a pull back down close to the breakout around 2475 would get my attention. I like the stock. All right. Let's go ahead and do that one, though, then. Uh, GDXJ. Yeah, I know. Greg, Greg, Greg's probably the one that sent it in. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Honestly, I like it. I got a PMO buy signal. Could be a double bottom that, you know, we've got there. Um, well, actually, I can't do it this way. Let's uh, let's go back and just take a look at the chart. Yeah, I don't like it, and I'll, and I'll be honest, I don't like it because of the fact that it's just not been a good re- performer relative to the S and P 500. So I'm going to bring this one up on a longer term chart, uh, and let's just go back the last 10 years, and I think this will probably show up as to why I don't like it. Um, you know, I'm trying to outperform the S and P 500 as a trader. That's my goal. And so trying to buy into and trying to profit from a stock or an ETF uh, that clearly has been underperforming the S&P 500 is it's a tough proposition. I mean, you have your timing has to be impeccable in a group that is 
you know, constantly underperforming. We had about eight months of relative strength on this chart, really dating back to the middle of 2011. We've had a couple of three months stints to the upside, but for the most part, we just continue to trade lower. And I want to point out that throughout 2017, we had a declining dollar. And with a declining dollar, the group couldn't uh, outperform the S&P 500. So that's, uh, you know, I don't know what else to say. I mean, that's the reason why I'm just not a fan of the group. I think uh, with what should have been tailwinds, the group still is lagging. So I, I just have to see more technically before I'd be interested. All righty. Let's look at uh, ARK Innovation ETF, A-R-K-K. -K. Uh, I like it. Uh, I got, the, I see that breakout. The PMO is looking great. Um, had a, a bull kiss, as I call them. Yeah, I, uh, I think this one looks really good, too. I think, first of all, we came down, we got that center line test on the PPO, made a big move up. You can see the PPO was rising. We pulled back, essentially hit that 20-day moving average, and then broke out with another breakout on the PPO. So I agree with you. I think this one's bullish. I think this is a, a nice-looking area of the market. All right. Let's go ahead and look at Nectar Therapeutics, NKTR. And yeah, I this, like it. Yeah, this one I think was just reporting earnings, I believe. Yeah, it must have been a couple of days ago where it reported. Yeah, this has been a very strong stock, and I don't have the scooter up here, but I got to believe the scooter on, maybe you can look that up. 99.8. Yeah, I mean, you know, it gets back to Greg's point on Twitter. Uh, you know, you get these stocks in the upper 90s in terms of their scooter score, and it's just confirming for you that they are among the best performing stocks out there. And if you're going to try and beat benchmark indices, I can't think of a better way than to have uh, or to own stocks that are clearly outperforming the benchmark. And so here you've got a uh, huge volume coming in. I'm pretty sure that was earnings report. It's pulling back the last couple of days. But again, I think this is going to be an opportunity at some point. Uh, probably about $90 is where I would look for entry if we can get a little bit more selling here. Okay. Uh, the next one, uh, UPS. Uh, I, you know, I just got a PMO buy signal. You know, it's it it does look like a possible bottom feeder sort of uh, opportunity. Yeah, I like it. I think that all of this Amazon news has really uh, set both uh, UPS and FedEx, especially UPS, up for a uh, move to the upside. I agree. I think that the the PPO, like the PMO turning up, I think looks really good. I think all this selling was overdone. We got an upgrade this morning. I think I spoke about that earlier. And now we're getting a, a breakout above the 20 day. First time we've seen this in over a month. So all in all, I kind of like what's going on here. One, one thing I'd be careful of is if we get a false breakout and come back down and say close around 108. Other than that, if we break above the 20, I think we have a shot to run here. Maybe another five, 10 bucks. All right. Uh peeking at this one i don't like it uh moody's mco pmo cell signal um it just uh not a half not a happy camper here on that one um i'm gonna go in the opposite direction i actually like it uh, i think that the pullback for me anyway is presenting an opportunity i can keep my stop fairly tight mm -hmm. um you know if you come along the uh the lows um, and I'm just going to try and draw something I mean, right in here, something like that. I mean, clearly we have lower or excuse me, higher lows and higher highs going in. So that's a good thing. I also like the fact that the PPO was rising at the time we had the most recent high. Usually that means the test of the 20 day moving average is a buy looking for a continuing move to the upside. I think to the downside, uh, maybe the recent low around 161 is some place to keep an eye on. But I actually think this one goes higher. I'd be looking for that breakout above 170 and make sure the volume comes in to confirm that move. All right. I like this one coming up. Nice breakout, PMO buy signal above the zero line. Uh, PINC, Premier Incorporated Business Support Services Industry. All right. Premier Inc. Uh, yeah, I like this breakout. Volume today, 400,000 shares, and we're just a little bit past the halfway point of the day. So it looks like it's going to be pretty decent volume, not huge volume, but pretty decent volume. And I think it supports a cup with handle breakout. The cup, uh, I think if you just look at this resistance right here, uh, I can pull up the parabola, which I always like to put these patterns in black. But basically right there, come down here to the low and then back up here to the high. You have this cup off of an uptrend, which is very important. Pull back to the 20 day is your handle. And now we're getting the breakout. This actually measures 
33 75 29 about four bucks i'm going to say 37 75 would be my measurement here all right let's see let's go to uh investment services lazard limited laz all right laz uh, a little bit of a downtrend uh short term but longer term I, i'm okay with it i think the problem is we had a, a negative divergence here so if we go back to the top where it topped in uh would have been in late uh, january right here you can see that the the ppo was already starting to roll over a little bit and so i think that led to sideways consolidation we did get down to the center line also to the 50-day moving average those are the things i tend to look for uh we do have uh so, well we had support initially in the uh, second week of february around the 52 and a half level we went a little bit below that on the open there so for me this is going to be a key area of support that i believe will hold uh, a move back up and a clearing of uh, 55 especially if volume kicks in i think will send us up to 58 to test the highs i actually think that the pullback is is a, a good thing get a little base uh, i would be a buyer of laz all right Let's see the next one, number nine, JP Morgan. I actually, this is one of my buy holds. I've had this for years. Smart move. I love JP Morgan. I think it's one of the best banks out there, maybe along with PNC. Uh, technically, the way they've been behaving, I think is good. We're in a higher interest rate environment, which I think is very good for banks. Having audited banks in my prior career as a CPA, I, uh, uh, I know that the higher interest rate environment is very good for bottom lines of banks. And as long as the economy strengthens, you don't have to worry as much about the uh, uh, loan loss reserves. And so usually what happens in this type of an environment is bank earnings tend to expand pretty quickly. They don't usually have a huge ad uh, advantage relative to the S&P 500, and you don't really need them to. I just like them to go along for the ride. And I think we're seeing that with J.P. Morgan, probably even seeing a little bit of relative strength. But I think J.P. Morgan's a great looking stock. I love it. All right. And let's see for our final. Did we talk about Amazon yet today? Because it has a really interesting chart. We have not. All right. Let's look at Amazon. Um, negative divergence on the PPO is what somebody was noting. Yeah, I uh, definitely would agree with that assessment. Um, but the I'm, I'm not really overly concerned by that negative divergence. And I'll tell you why. There's a couple of different ways we could draw this. But basically, we could go from these highs. I could just go from these two highs. Uh, and you will see that the PPO is lower in each of these cases. But one thing that uh, I'm still always bullish about is if we're getting a breakout with volume. Today, we do have uh, roughly 3 million shares already traded on Amazon. It looks like we're probably heading for five and a half, six million. That is not light volume. It's, it's moderate volume. It's not the heaviest that we've seen as we saw during all of this you know, volatility. Um, but that's still pretty solid volume. So I think accumulation is taking place on Amazon. And I believe by the end of 2018, it's just my opinion, I think Amazon's going to pass Apple in terms of market cap. So I, and that's just a bold prediction because I think Apple is going to be strong as well. I just think Amazon is going to be stronger. All right. And that concludes the 10 and 10. So we will have those charts with the annotations up for you. The link is at the top of the Market Watchers Live blog. And if you're going to go back and watch the archives, I highly recommend you go check out the Mar Market Watchers Live recaps because I do have in there the timestamps. So if you want to go directly to a particular segment, uh, you can use that to do that. And with that, I'm going to go talk to you about ChartCon. So let me go ahead and grab that screen. ChartCon is coming up in August. And it Greg is Snell's going to be there. Indeed, he is. I will be. Yep. More is the reason to go. Or Tom might say that the reason not to, but we'll see. No, I'm going to say <laughs> it's a reason to go because I will, I will say this. Greg, it, he should earn Entertainer of the Year at Stock Charts. He is a funny, funny guy. I mean, you probably get a little of that on the air, but when you're talking to him, he is, he's got story after story. And literally, I usually am picking myself up off the floor laughing at him exactly but, so you yeah. can go online and register it's stockcharts.com slash chart con but we also have the opportunity to be a vip and michael wrote about it right here it's a great experience if you want to go there live here is our link at the bottom here to learn more 
and you can sit right up front. You get to meet all of us and hang out with us. I mean, we're we're not stuck in our rooms the whole time. We're usually out and about. So lots of chances to interact with all of us. And if you want to really get into it, uh, we'd love to have you join us on the Alaskan cruise that we're going to go on right after that. And then you can really be regaled by all of Greg's funny stories. <laughs> So with that, let's go ahead. I'm going to move. I'm a specialist on cold weather, too, so. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to Alaska. That's why we're, that's why we're bringing Greg. Fight All off right. Bears. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, go into our market update, the final one. Just give us everybody a quick look at what's been going on. Sometimes a lot goes on while we're talking and sometimes not so much. So let's go ahead and take a peek. I'm going to go down here and for my Canadian friends and Greg, you're with us. I always add the TSX and I'll, I think I'll add TLT today. Oh, that's not going to work because I have a dollar sign, but that's okay. Well, we can see, you know, we started off to the negative and just recently, what, in the last 20 minutes, we've managed to get into positive territory for the Dow, uh, the S&P as well. NASDAQ wasn't having quite the difficulty as it did the others in the morning. Uh, look at the small caps, though. They had that pullback in the, the morning, and now they have just been off to the races, already setting new intraday highs and continuing to do so. Uh, the TSX, uh, you know, consolidated mostly, but along with the other large cap indexes here, U U.S., we're seeing a move to the upside. Treasury yields are mostly unchanged right now, uh, reading at 287 and we can see that a UUP gap down. What's up with the dollar here? It's really struggling here. Uh, I think it's because I've been bullish on it. But anyway, we gap down. Looks like we're forming a cup, though. We might be able to get back up and, and cover that gap, if not today, tomorrow. The commodities are mostly unchanged, moving sideways, oil, same. You can see gold gapped up. It was really off to the races, but it's pulling back now. And uh, we'll see if it can get back to that gap support and hold it right around 126.15. The VIX is now falling, and we're looking at a reading of 18.30. Uh, so we're seeing some comfort right now, or a little bit of complacency, not as much fear in the markets going on right now. Market summary. Let's see where our sectors are currently. There we go. And as you can see, materials and industrials are leading today. Uh, laggard, big laggard, uh, utilities. You know, we had we were seeing that moving up a lot uh, over the last couple of days, but now it's pulling itself back down. We can see as far as U.S. industries, gold is having the best day, uh, op up over two and three quarters of a percent for the XAU. And our laggard, uh, not surprising to see utilities. And drugs are the only two industry groups right now that are reading in the negative. And with that, I'm going to conclude it because I know we're going to have a very healthy discussion for our agree and disagree. So I'm going to hand it back to you and, and let's get this party started for agree or disagree. All right. Yeah. On agree or disagree, what we decided we would do today, and we've got Greg here, so we want to get his thoughts as well. Um, but the question is... Um, in terms of steel, of course, steel has been in the news. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, you, there are a lot of talks about tariffs on imports here in the U.S. And of course, the group has been doing really well. So really, the statement is um, steel. Is it is it a buy for the for essentially the balance of 2018 or it is a buy for the balance of 2018? Do we agree or disagree? Um, who wants to go first? Not me. Yeah, right. uh, well, <laughs> the point I would make if I was to steal the screen, um, let me just uh, take a couple of seconds here. Uh, the, the one thing that I want to make sure of on steel is that in general, uh, we haven't had good movement from the, uh, sorry, I'm just not as fast as Aaron and, and uh, Tom on getting the share screen up here. Okay, you hopefully you can see this is GE, but I'm going to put up SLX. You got more than 30 seconds this time, so you oh, don't have good. to. Oh, good. <laughs> Man, 
I, I'm a long-winded guy. I can't talk that fast. Um, so the one thing that I, I'm looking at on the steel chart a lot here is this breakout, call it 50 bucks over here. It's 45, whatever. So if we just draw a horizontal line at 45, I'm a little bit more concerned um, that this breakout doesn't hold. So that would be a, uh, a big issue for me. And the reason that um, I'm so concerned about that is I'm just seeing more industrial stock weakness. Um, so that's bothering me a little bit. Now, I will say the one thing I like to look at on the PMO or sorry, on the PPO is I like to see this uptrend hold. And this is pretty good. But as you can see, we'll just change the line style here. OK, so for everybody, what I did there was I did this line on the overlay section and I did this line as an annotation and the only um, reason for that is uh, if I quickly decide that I picked the wrong level I just type in the wrong number in this case I could drag it around because I was opening annotation anyway but in general when I look at the the chart for steel the biggest thing that I'm worried about is um, is that I'm not getting enough positive momentum from the commodities. Now, if the US dollar ends up rolling over and the emerging markets resume their uptrend and we start to see uh, you know, breakouts in the commodities again or in the commodity stocks, I'd be thrilled to get on board. But um, I'm actually noticing so many of these charts breaking this uptrend that it's driving me crazy. And I think for people who had listened to the Commodity Countdown last week, I, I mentioned angst in commodities um, as the title. But that's the reason. For, if we're so late in this bull market, um, normally materials and energy should be just rocking it out the door. And, you know, copper's been at the same level as it has been for eight months. So that's one of the big things that I'm worried about. I don't like the lower high on the full stochastic on this recent high. Um, the PMO is still uptrending. So maybe I'm just a little too whingy on the whole thing, but I don't like it when Canada has been so weak. And uh, as a commodity country, that shouldn't really be, be there. So I would guess yeah, you're on the disagree. Uh, yeah, I'm disagree. Okay. Uh, you ready, Aaron? Yeah, I'll go. Let me get my screen up here. And I will tell you that I'm going to agree instead. Of course, you know, got to have a few different opinions come out here. And here's why. All right. So first of all, you did mention that too, uh, Greg, about the PPO rising, and we're seeing that with the PMO, of course, at the same time. Yet when I look here, we've got at best, you know, uh, move sideways, uh, but I see it as a slight downward um, move there. And the PMO and the OBV were both rising. We saw rising bottom bottoms on the OBV, uh, declining ones here as you went from here to here. So I'm seeing some positives. And then, of course, this really interesting flag formation. And, you know, I don't like that we didn't get the, that that breakout didn't hold uh, on steel earlier. But, you know, I feel like we're consolidating. We've got this flag forming, um, you know, the 50s so far above the 200. It's been performing well relative, I think, to the S&P 500. So I'm going to say that I... Um, agree that it's a buy for 2018 if we get that breakout really i'd like to see that flag uh execute uh decisively meaning you get a about a three percent breakout of the flag wow okay you all yeah. are still in your 30 second mode i know right um no that's I, I think that as far as the daily chart is concerned i mean we can always go and start talking weekly and monthly too so all right well that's exactly what i'm going to talk i'm going to talk well, I'm not going to go into to monthly. I mean, that would take me forever. Actually, you're going to go through the weekly? <laughs> well, yeah, I look here at the weekly. Actually, I want to look at the monthly because I can see we've got some interesting. There it is. Those style buttons are just, you, you have to use them if you don't use them already. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you could see that 350 level is certainly doable, I would say. Um, you know, and it, it's it's a common level here for these bottoms and the previous tops over here. So I would look for at least a move up there. Uh, look at the PMO, buy signal moving up. So this, you know, I think this even looks pretty good for the long term. Uh, I think you could even annotate maybe in a reverse head and shoulders, but I think you'd be kind of reaching a little there. But uh, I think overall, I like I like steel. 
uh, I don't follow it as closely as Greg, though, so. All right, uh, so we got one agree and one disagree. And so let me go through first and look at the daily chart. Um, yeah, first I, I would annotate this. Uh, I think that the daily chart looks pretty bullish at this point. Uh, right. You've got a uh, breakout here back in uh, December, which was nice. Came back, we retested that level. Then we had a breakout here. We never really came back. We just went straight up and we got up to the top. See that false breakout right there that we talk about this a lot. But when I get a when I get a uh, a stock or an index like this, and you can see that PPO has rolled over, so we're starting to lose momentum, and then you get a false breakout, so that the price uh, here is confirming what we're seeing on the PPO. That's usually not a good sign. Doesn't mean that I'm going to see that, but I do expect weakness after a false breakout like that. Saw a little bit of one here, uh, kind of a not really a shooting star because it requires a gap up, but we did see an inverted hammer, um, and many times that also is very similar to the shooting star, false breakout, blah, blah, blah. And so we've seen consolidation after all that. But in between all of this, notice we did make a move all the way back down to test this last breakout level. So I think we've got a pattern of higher highs and higher lows in play on the steel index. Volume has been coming in. Of course, it has been in the news. I can't really argue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save this. Uh, I may come back to it. Um, so I can't really argue with the short-term bullish outlook here. My problem really, though, is on the longer term, um, you know, because we do see rotation from time to time. And if I pull up the longer term chart, this is going back 10 years. So throughout the bull market, first of all, here's steel. Um, we have been in a nine year bull market and literally we are still trying to uh, to pass the 2011 highs. Um, so on a relative basis, clearly steel has not been a great performer. And here's the relative chart. Since that high, you can see relative to the S&P, we have not been doing great. Now it's starting to turn up a little bit and you can see there is a trend line, but I'd put this dotted line in here because we also had a trend line uh, if we had connected the lows back in the fourth quarter of 2016 and that broke. And so now we're making a move up. Who's to say that this trend line isn't gonna break? I. I personally would not take a shot on steel from a longer term perspective. When I say longer term, I mean the balance of 2018 until I get that breakout. I, I think that's major overhead resistance looking back many years. I do think the short term looks pretty bullish, but in my view, the longer term trumps the short term. And we've got some pretty significant overhead resistance. I think the bull market overall is going to continue later in 2018, although I do think it could shift away from the S&P 500 leading. I think if the dollar does strengthen down the road, I think that's going to put a little bit of a headwind in for the S&P 500. I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe the NASDAQ and, and maybe even the Russell 2000 uh, begin to show some strength, uh, in particular the Russell 2000 if the dollar strengthens. But a lot of ifs in there. But in the meantime, I think if, if I'm looking at a market that I believe is going to go higher and I've got a major overhead resistance here for steel and i got to make the call today, I'm going to say that I disagree. Um, oh, I, my goodness. You're ganging up on me, the two of you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can understand the agree. I mean, I think this is a difficult one because on the daily chart, it does look a lot better. But with major overhead resistance on the weekly chart, I just I'd have to see that breakout first. I mean, everything here, if you look at this weekly chart the last two years, you can see that the PPO has been above the center line throughout. And that's generally a pretty good sign. And when we go back over the last several years, we well, maybe here. Uh, back in 2009, 2011, when we first came out of the bear market, it looked pretty, pretty solid. But since then, it's really struggled to stay above the center line, which we have been doing. So I think there are arguments both sides. So I'm not surprised that we have a little bit of disagreement between us. And I'd be actually interested to see what uh, everyone else thinks. Um, you know, the similarity like on 2009 to 2011 is shocking with 2016 to 2018. Yeah. Um, you know, briefly breaking out and then rolling over in 2011. Um, and now I, I feel like we're up against the same thing. But uh, the, the the main concern I have, uh, going back to the, the point and figure charts that I put up, was that all of the commodity um, companies are not kicking it up yet. And, you know, I'd be the first one <laughs> to... <laughs> 
happy with commodities kicking it up. But if if you take um, Tom's chart there and just put up the Canadian uh, stock market dollar sign TSX, um, it's Wait, just really weak. You want weekly or? Uh, yeah, weekly is great. But that chart almost mimics the Canadian stock market um, that you're seeing. And, and we recently broke out and now we've struggled, but we've struggled at the 2014, 2015 highs. And, and the problem, uh, again, we've broken the uptrend line both in, in price trend and PPO momentum trend. So that would suggest to me, you know, maybe we bounce up here and retest the highs or whatever, but the momentum is clearly lacking for these commodity stocks to kind of get ripping. And, you know, uh, considering that, you know, steel tariffs are supposed to be so bullish for the US steel companies, um, it didn't seem to help a whole bunch on the charts. So you'd, you'd think three days later, the charts would have been up 10 or 15% and they're flat. So, um, I, I don't think that steel breakout is is so bullish. Um, the that's a concern to me. But the bigger picture is that all of the commodity stocks in general uh, just continue to fail. Yeah, in the last bull market we had, you know, uh, prior to the last bear. I mean, we're talking two thousand two to two thousand seven. We had a really nice bull market in commodities. But if you recall, we had a, a weakening dollar throughout that period. In this case, even though the dollar has been weak over the last year. We bottomed on the dollar, I think, back in 2011 or 2012, and and I still argue that we're in an uptrend, although it's making it more difficult, especially if we break to another new low, it's going to be difficult to maintain that stance. But that longer term uh, look at the dollar, I think, you know, and the fact that we have come off the bottom and have continued for the most part moving higher until the last year. I think that's really been too much of a headwind for the commodities to participate in this bull market. So I think the dollar holds the key. And you mentioned that earlier, Greg, you know, if we, you know, if this consolidation that we're in on the dollar index fails and we go back down and we break down the new lows, I think at that point we could see a pretty significant rally in commodities. But my gut is that the dollar is going to hold and continue moving higher based on some charts that I've shown in the past, looking at the treasury yields here in the U S versus Germany, we continue to rise. Uh, that continues to rise relative to Germany. And typically what happens is the dollar follows that to the upside. Um, and uh, so we'll see what happens. But uh, clearly there's a lot of indecision, not just in steel, but with a lot of the, the commodities, the dollar and so forth. So, um, but uh, how? Do, what about yeah. the audience? I mean, is the audience agreed or disagreed? Do we have that poll? Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, even if we could get that move to test that overhead resistance, you know, that that puts us, if you look at the high at 340-ish, hmm. I'd take that ride <laughs> from yeah. 305 to 340. I'd take that ride. It's over 10%. That's a good point. And if uh, you do want to, you know, look at that reverse head and shoulders as a possibility, um, you know, that says we're going to get even higher than that. So it'll be interesting. The live audience, see, I'm, I'm definitely being ganged up on here. But uh, you're we'll probably going to be right. Well, you know, that's the way I it works. Right a lot. <laughs> that's the way it works. You know, if you're, if you're going against the grain. <laughs> All right. I will say, if if um, the gold bugs or the the GLD starts to break ten, trend compared to the uh, S and P 500, I expect that to actually be a huge buy signal. Um, so the relative strength line that Tom had put up for uh, for, for steel and for the gold chart um, when he had uh, 10 and 10, I would say that the when that downtrend breaks in relative strength, I would be really watching for a breakout in gold because if it even breaks that downtrend, that was a 150% move back in 2016. So, Yeah, I agree with you. I, I'm not sure we're going to get it, but if we do, I would definitely agree. Um, you know, let's keep an eye on the dollar. We'll keep an eye on the gold chart and some of the other commodities. But uh, it's at least interesting to discuss right now. And, you know, uh, Aaron, you were kind of joking a little bit. Everybody's ganging up on me. But uh, on the poll, you can see that it was pretty close. It was a pretty close vote. Yeah, uh, it's still eight, still cha ever changing. I might might get a little bit of points here at the end. We'll see. No, we're gonna, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna you know, enough enough precincts have reported at this point. Oh, okay. We gotta. Follow it. <laughs> <laughs> I always I, like that. Some, aren't there some hanging chads left out there? Mm -hmm. that I can... <laughs> don't, don't you like that when you're watching the election? And they're like, okay, seven percent of the precincts have reported. We're gonna project a winner. Yeah, like, I know. Ninety-three percent haven't voted yet. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't understand how that works sometimes, but uh, well, it doesn't always work as we've seen, but uh, yes. enough of that. I don't even yeah. want to go down that road. So, <laughs> Oh, I do have one question for Greg since we have him here. Yeah. Got a couple more minutes um, and we haven't had you on a little while. You know, the market's been crazy volatile. And so if you could just take maybe a couple minutes and just explain to everybody, how are you approaching the market right now? I mean, when you see this kind of volatility and, you know, the VIX shooting up and these big, you know, 500 point moves in the Dow back and forth and we're consolidating, do you kind of, you know, go into your shell and hybrid? Well, go into your shell. Uh, <laughs> shell and hibernate? No. Um, I think the biggest thing that um, I'm looking for is the, um, I, I expect, the, the large caps to still outperform. Um, my my uh, chart watchers article on the weekend showed that most corrections are four to six weeks. We've been five weeks with the um, S and P 500. So let me just zoom in on the last few uh, weeks here. So this correction period here is five weeks so far. We we've just come down and retested the low. I expect this bounce to go up and maybe into April take us up above this level. I would expect the Nasdaq to probably go way above the level. But what I really don't like seeing is the the trend on the Russell, and I'll show that to you here. Is that um, you know we're starting to break uh, an important. Uh, trend level and again one day doesn't make a trend but um, you know this is broken on my chart um, so I don't like when the Russell starts to get down here you know maybe it just dips below and starts to change trend back to the upside again maybe I should should be more optimistic but I think the the bigger thing that I'm watching for is it's struggling to get above its 10-week moving average and it's holding above its 40-week but this trend that I'm seeing in the Russell where these momentum trend lines are breaking and you can I mean, you can draw them all over, but they're a great place to just be aware of the trend change. And so, you know, in here, basically you had nothing going on with the Russell. Sure, it made a little bit higher highs, but it also made lower lows. So, um, I, you know, when the Russell starts to break this big two-year trend, I'm a little bit worried, and I also don't like this picture. So, um, again, the small caps are starting to to disappoint, and that disappointment is is the bigger deal. Mm -hmm. So um, I expect the large caps, though, to continue to run in the U.S., and I don't usually see the U.S. as the first market to fail. I'm waiting for markets like Germany. Um, the Nikkei's been um, decimated down 3,000 points or something. So uh, this doesn't look like much, but this was 24,000 to 21,000. So if the Dow fell 3,000 points, um, you know, we don't like it. And I would just say the Nikkei's at a really important support, but it's having trouble getting back above its 40 week moving average. So uh, don't like that. There's a, you know, their uptrend and momentum is broken. I could say the same for the DAX, the Canadian, the blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'm watching the rest of the world and see how it resolves. And I think it'll all be, it'll all turn out when we finally get a direction on the US dollar. Okay, well, I will point out the Dow did fall 3,000 points. Uh, yeah, we, and, and we weren't comfortable with it. The only difference is I think you're in the strongest market in the world, not one of the weaker ones. And so, um, you know, this Nikkei is really trying to hold this this 2015 high. And if this breakout doesn't hold, and I don't expect it to, um, I think the Nikkei starts to leak. And that's probably a bigger um, indicator for me of global weakness. Yeah, no doubt about it. And first of all, I just want to say thanks. For, uh, thanks for participating in the sound off. I know, you know, we were talking about it before the show. Uh, I think Greg was trying to push for more time to uh, to analyze the stocks and all. And while it would be great, I think it was a good lesson in just showing folks how quickly you can analyze stocks um, and come up with uh, some opinions. And, you know, maybe if you looked at it a little bit longer, you change your opinion, but you can quickly make uh, an assessment on a stock, say, relative to a benchmark index or relative to its peers or whatever, pretty quickly. And uh, that's the amazing thing about technical analysis. But again, thanks for joining the show, Greg. It's always awesome to have you on here, my friend. Yeah, yeah I think the the funny part is, you know, I, I just quickly went and looked at what the Japanese stock market is doing without doing a lang language translation and their earnings ratios and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, you can quickly pop in on a market and check check it out technically uh, pretty fast. I will say that I'm watching the railroads closely. They they had had no lift today, even though the rest of the market was kind of moving up. They uh, as a percentage, it was pretty small. Um, so when I'm when I'm watching these, I'm really watching this uptrend in the price oscillator momentum and this trend line here. When 
back in 2014, 15, when the railway started to break down, that was one of the better clues that we were going to struggle in 2015. So as long as the railways hold up, I'm probably even more bullish. But All right. Yeah. Something to watch. Exactly. All right. Here's the weekly schedule. I'll let Aaron go through that with you. Yep. Tomorrow, Mr. Martin Pring will be here. You'll want to definitely join us for that. Tushar Chande has agreed to come on the show Thursday and Friday. Tom is going to have his workshop. And uh, I think the if you want to still uh, put in your requests for what you might want him to talk about, take that uh, survey at the bottom of the uh, page here under how do we do. Yeah, I still haven't come up with a topic, so you still have time. Uh, probably decide later today, so uh, definitely put that in the survey. And again, let us know what you think of Sound Off. Uh, I thought it was a pretty fun segment, but we certainly would like to know what you all thought of it. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much a wrap for today. I want to thank everybody for stopping by. I appreciate Greg coming on board and, and giving us his thoughts today. Uh, again, please remember to complete that, egg, that, that survey as you exit bottom part of your screen. How do we do? You'll see a link there. Very brief little survey, and you can uh, uh, let us know what you think. Um, uh, quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everybody. We'll be back here on Wednesday. Happy trading.